go. Okay. There you go. So this is the note. Well, uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, this is the uh, terms we operate under at the ITF. Uh, the best thing to do is to find your favorite search engine and search for IETF note well, and it'll tell you things about a code of conduct, uh, uh, which is, is, is probably the most important here, although I think intellectual property issues are, are close behind, uh, working group procedures, things like that. So here, I'll make it bigger there. Um, so please have a look at that if you're not familiar with it. Uh, blue sheets we have in a, can you see this? Separate document. Uh, this is how we record participation. So please follow the link in the agenda and put your name and affiliation in. And I'll do that right now to show you how. Ah! There we go. Uh... We have a scribe. Thank you, Martin. Uh, the agenda today, we were talking about this a little bit before the call. We we wanted in this meeting just to have a quick overview of the status of our, our currently in process drafts, make sure that they were still moving, uh, talk about some of the issues uh, so that when we get to the Philadelphia meeting, we, we haven't had a, a, a long period where we haven't talked about them. Uh, so it's just the one meeting today for two hours. Talk about signatures, then cookies, alternative services, uh, client search. Julian, who's the lead author on the query method, it wasn't able to make the call, and he suggested design team meetings. We'll talk about that briefly when we get to that. And then finally, the retrofit draft. Any more agenda bashing? We, 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 by the way, we do intend to talk about uh, proposals and, and potential new work uh, if, if people have them in the Philadelphia, Philadelphia meeting, but we just wanted this to be a working meeting about the, the current drafts. Anything? Okay, well, let's get right into it then. Justin, are you with us? I am. Lovely. See, video is in. Okay, good. Um, so, yeah, I do not have slides uh, for today. Um, but uh, as folks probably saw, there is a new draft of signatures. Um, two main things to highlight in the new draft. Uh, first off, we had previously had a feature in signatures that allowed you to, uh, in a response message, to sign a signature that had been included in the request message. And that generated a lot of discussion of why is this only just for this one narrow thing? Couldn't we come up with a way to do it sort of generically across the message? And a few ideas were kind of bounced around. And, uh, and honestly, Annabelle and I had talked about that initially, and we hated every version that we had come up with um to uh, uh to do it in a more generic way but thankfully the discussion um that came up i think uh actually came up with a uh, a much better way to handle things so if you can actually click through to section 2.3 request uh, request response signature binding um basically the short of it is that there's a new parameter flag uh called uh, REC, REQ, uh, which basically says in a response, um, this particular piece of um, the, this particular message component that's being named here doesn't come from the response that's being signed. It's coming from the request that uh, triggered this response. And um, we changed around a bit of the language around um, where message context or sorry where the message signature context is drawn from to sort of incorporate that because it actually does make sense that when you're signing a response you're signing it in the context of a uh, of a request and um, so this basically allows us to do uh, to do generically what we had been doing very specifically with just signing a, uh, a previous signature before um, and because I'm lazy, the example still just signs a signature from the, uh, from the previous manage, uh, from, uh, from the request message, which was the example that we had before. I will probably, uh, expand that, uh, when I get a chance to update the, um, uh, update the request or sorry, the example generating script, um, to have a couple of additional, um, parameters like pull in the, 
the method or the, you know, the content digest or something like that from the request uh, to show how that all actually fits together. Um, so we removed the at request response um, derived component and replaced that functionality with this parameter, which goes across all, um, almost all uh, mess, uh, message components. And uh, there should be, the text there should be fairly clear about where and when you use it. This had an interesting follow on effect of um, forcing us to clean up the IANA registration section, um, which had now gotten uh, a little bit uh, out of sync because we had multiple parameters in there. So there is now a parameters registry. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's section six. Yeah, section six. Um, so the algorithms are still there. It's the uh, 6.4, the component parameters registry is the new one um, where we actually go and write down the different parameters that, uh, that we have and uh, enumerate the places where they can actually be used, or at least that is the, uh, that is the intent of this structure. So the key field can only be, sorry, the key parameter can only be used on dictionary structured fields as specified here. Uh, the name can only be used on the at query param, um, uh, derived component, and so on and so forth. Um, so this, uh, I'm, I'm honestly not particularly happy with the paragraph for target text. Uh, it's, it's, I found it kind of difficult to describe what we were after there and how to tell people really just where to use this parameter is ultimately what we need, but I was trying to do that very formally. So if anybody has suggestions on that bit, or obviously any of the rest of it, you know, please let me know, but I, that, that part bugs me. <laughs> um, um, let's see the, um, any questions on, um, any questions on this, uh, this feature, um, of the request response before I go into the other changes. Oh, Martin, why not just rely on the specification? Because I wanted it in the, in the table uh, as a shorthand, um, quite frankly. Um, but is, is, the, is the question about specification versus having an IANA table at all? Oh, or? actually, you know, that I may have misunderstood the, uh, the question. Martin, could you, could you ask? Uh, question so uh i guess the question really is why not rely on the specification and avoid the problem entirely oh uh, what um, problem are we avoiding uh, the, the target yes. the, the target thing um okay. so you, you you're trying to sort of summarize the specification in this right. target thing um mm -hmm. or at least a, a good portion of it right and that's challenging obviously so, why why not avoid that work? There's a specification you, that you're referencing. Yeah, you you might be right. Um, I was I was trying to have it in there as kind of a shorthand for uh, for anybody you know using the information off the registry. But honestly, it needs to uh, it does need to be um, uh, it does need to be fully specified anyway. Um, what I would like to have, though, is uh, at least retain the requirement for that uh, for the targeting of the parameter itself to be specified in anything new that gets registered. So if a parameter can only be used on fields or only be used on a specific derived component, uh, or even if it's a newly defined derived component or something like that, um, I would want somebody who's, who's making this definition to have to go through that exercise and enumerate that. Um, so having it in the table was to me kind of, an, it seemed like to be an easier, easy way to do that, but you make a very good point that, uh, if we just require that as part of the registration, then, uh, we can probably just drop that column, which I'm fine with. All right. Um. So uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the WebEx chat and I don't have a Jabber client. Um, 
Is there anybody in the queue for the request response stuff before we roll on? No, okay. Um, okay, so uh, the really the other major change to this uh, to this spec has been editorial. Uh, we've tried to go through and follow the style guidelines uh, as best as we could in terms of how we're uh, referencing other specs and sections, um, uh, how we're referencing things like. Uh, you know, field names and uh, defining structured field uh, data types and things like that, uh, pulling out some of our extraneous um, ABNF references that had been stand-ins for what actually were the structured field data types before in most places. Um, we do have one place, uh, the signature-based generation, which does actually use the ABNF. Uh, and some of those values are pulled from structured fields. So uh, that will remain. If you want to pull that up, that's section 2.4, I think. Nope, apparently not. 3.1. No, it is 2.4. Wow, I was right. Okay, my bad. I totally, totally missed that. Um, but basically, this is the bit that makes makes the string that you throw at the crypto functions. And so uh, it does, even though you're not parsing it uh, at any point, it does make sense to have that specified in a very uh, strict way um, so that you can show you know, like, this is how you generate this piece and, and so forth. Uh, component identifier is another rule that is specified up in message components. We might pull all of these together and just forward reference. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the best practice is there uh, because this is the place where it's really actually needed. Uh, is in the signature based generation. Um, so there's a little bit of cleanup to do on the ABNF, but um, hopefully throughout the spec now, we are not using ABNF where, uh, where we don't need to. Um, so places where we're talking about, you know, dictionary fields and, um, you know, uh, integer items and binary items and things like that are, are all using the structured field data types uh, throughout the spec. Um, question is more than one way to pass the target URI. Um, so Roberto asks, there's more than one way to pass the target URI. Uh, sort of, you can pass the target URI or you can pass the pieces of the target URI. Uh, so you can either pass it as a whole URI, um, or sorry, you can specify it as a whole URI or you can specify the pieces of the URI, uh, be it authority scheme, uh, path and query and things like that. Does it make sense to pick one? Uh, if you can get the world to agree on which one, sure. Which is to say no. I, I think it's gonna be application specific, which one makes more sense. Very, very strongly believe that. Um, series of steps listed are the second level bullets supposed to be read as op two dot. L Lucas, can we take that question offline? I I I'm email me about that. I'm not I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, and I think that that's probably too much detail for for this call. Um, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, in all honesty, like uh, the spec is really starting is. We're starting to see more and more implementations on different platforms coming up. Um, I just in the last couple of re weeks uh, personally released a very, very dodgy but functional Java implementation uh, that I had extracted from uh, from one of my uh, projects as well as a Python implementation. Um, and I hope to refine those going forward. We've seen this in Go and JavaScript and uh, PHP and someone else's Python version and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so we're, uh, somebody claims they're working on a Rust version. I haven't seen it yet. Um, but uh, there's a, a lot of people are take, picking this up and building it now. And um, we are, I would venture to say we're around the corner from uh, from last call on this. The core document's been pretty stable. Um, it still needs a bit of editorial bug shaking, but uh, I think we're getting there. Um, I, uh, 
yeah, a lot of the issues that uh, that we've gone through are, you know, either a little bit of cleanup or um, sort of editorial stuff that Annabelle and I need to just kind of come down on one side or another and um, and, you know, declare. Um, there is an interesting issue that I'd like folks in the group to take a look at. That is signature context number 2133 that was raised by Yaron. Um, and uh, I'm not going to get into the details of, of this here. Please read uh, the discussion in the issue. It's, it's pretty thoroughly written up. Um, both Yaron and I come down on uh, slightly different sides on, on where this should go. Um, and uh, I would love to hear more people's input on whether or not we should incorporate that. And if we do, uh, to what level it should be required. Um, but yeah, that's, that's in a nutshell, that's signatures. Um, oh, uh, one last thing for the working group. We did also update HTTPSIG.org. So it's actually a lot clearer whether you're signing and, and verifying. So go play around with that. Uh, it's probably still broken in weird ways that I haven't noticed yet. So let me know. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I, I'll just uh, mention this looks like we've been making good progress. I'm, I'm happy to see that. Uh, I'm starting to see questions from folks about uh, spec, st spec stability. They want to, to be able to reference it. So, I mean, there's a natural tension there. We want to make sure that we get it right. But uh, it sounds like uh, maybe in Philadelphia we can start thinking about last call. Would that be reasonable? Yeah, I think that that's reasonable. Um, okay. Honestly, the the core process hasn't changed in almost a year. It's it's been at least nine months, if not a little bit longer. That that you know this the the core signing and evaluating algorithms um, and and process that that we made any actual changes to that, um, not counting the uh, the. Uh, request flag that that just got added, but that as sort of an optional additional feature, I don't even uh, you know that was added into the process. I don't even really consider that a core change. So yeah, it's been really really stable, um, and people are building it and throwing things at it. So that that to me is a really good sign. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so uh, hopefully we'll have more to talk about in Philadelphia. There, thanks. For uh, I think Martin's on the queue. Oh, oh, go ahead. Um, Sorry. Just wanted to give you time to finish that conversation. Uh, I think 1664 is probably one that would need to be resolved before it gets stability. I think, I think 1664, it's, it's about the missing fields. Uh, oh. try, try or again. 1864, maybe. I can't read the, the tiny crab font that Mark's got. Yeah. <laughs> um. Someone recommended I buy a really big screen. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> great for you, but not for us in here. Um, yeah, so that one. Yeah, I, I think we had a bit of a disagreement about what what exactly the the intent was. Yeah, I was thinking right. beer too. Thanks, Lucas. Um, yeah, so this the where I left it was. Uh, I considered myself to be a bit in the rough on this. Uh, I was trying to. Uh, fill in what I thought was a gap in something that it seems that nobody actually wanted. Um, and uh, so I'm fine with closing this in the associated PR without resolution as part of the last call process. Um, and uh, with uh, honestly, with the new parameters registry, um, this is actually something that could be added as an extension with with clear semantics if somebody really wanted it. I, I actually disagree with that outcome. I think okay. probably we've had some confusion on this one. Um, so there is there is a change in the signature input that is important here. So when you when you have a missing field and you need to know that it's missing, mm -hmm. that information needs to be encoded in, encoded in the signature input. Correct. We we agree on that point. I think the the difference of opinion I think was whether the um and this is confusing the signature input field that describes which things are being signed mm -hmm. whether it is also encoded there right and i am opposed to having it encoded there i believe you you believe that it's um that it has to be encoded there correct and that's the difference of opinion that we have but i don't think we can get away with not fixing the 
you know, the, the thing that goes into the signature as opposed to the, the field it, it itself. So uh, there, is a, there is a change that's necessary in order to capture the fact that the field is absent as you feed the signature itself. So right now, an absent field that is that is listed in the um, in the input list uh, is an error in the signature base generation. Right. So I think that's the problem that we're dealing with here um, because an error is not what this feature is is looking to address. Correct. But if I know that it's absent when I'm signing, and I'm not telling the verifier that it's absent when I'm signing then that's that's where i don't i don't agree with uh with your proposed um uh usage okay well maybe we we need to continue this conversation elsewhere but um i i don't think this is stable without resolution to this this issue so um, my my read on the entire discussion was that this doesn't seem to be something that anybody actually wants. Uh, and a lot of that discussion was in the PR, not in this issue. Yeah, I was going to say, where is the discussion? Yeah, it's uh, in 1976. It's it's in the PR. Yeah, All right, trying to done that. My bad. Um, no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, there's there's a lot of comments here. And I, I understand what you're saying, Martin. Um, my my fundamental thesis is that it's the signer that needs to decide whether they expect it, the field to be there or not. Yeah, so I disagree on that point. So. Right, exactly. Yeah. But regardless of whether you and I disagree on how, how to indicate that, I don't think anybody actually wants to sign missing fields. I, I haven't had anybody say this is something that I really need to do. Yeah, I think this is from a security perspective potentially necessary um, in some contexts. So you need to know that something is absent, otherwise the the um, the interpretation could change. But um, maybe not. I don't know. That that was my uh, you know that was that was my impetus for trying to include the feature in the first place. Yes. All right. All right. So more of a security architecture perspective than a specific driving use case, but in absence of a specific driving use case and absence of agreement about how to do it, I'm kind of like me. Okay. And I apologize. I haven't minuted all of that just yet. Um, I will. Try to remember what we just said. You're muted, Mark. You're, you're muted. I was saying, uh, so it sounds like there still needs to be some discussion there, and at worst case, we can have a live discussion of it in Philadelphia. Right. Roberto. Uh, uh, I, I thought about uh, that, and while on, on some on a point of view, I, I agree with Martin. I think that the point of adding the um, uh, exclusion of fields, uh, as uh, Yaron says in, in the comment I linked, open a, a green field of issues about why uh, I can sign an absence of a field, but not an absence of a parameter. I mean, uh, I always thought that claiming claiming or signing part of a field is problematic, and I think that the, this probably the, this issue uh, goes uh, goes uh, highlights the fact that uh, the fact that it is hard to to take all, all this kind of absence. With the same granularity. I guess in my mind, this this raises the question of you know if if the use case is a new header field or or trailer field, um, and I want to you know sign a particular state, then I have the option of 
making that state explicit, not not you know flagging it with the absence of that. Or um, it's only for existing headers. I think that this is really something that comes up. Is is that? Does anyone disagree with that? I I don't think whether it's a new field or an existing field. And I, I'm sorry. Do you mean new and existing in terms of specification definition or transit through a proxy? A specification definition. Okay, then, uh, then yeah, that's actually not um, that that distinction is not actually relevant here. It would apply equally to newly defined or uh, you know undefined or existing fields. It, so absent just means that the signer says that this is a field that does not exist in the request or the in the message. Like this is a field that I am declaring does not exist in in the message that is signed by the target, right? That right. is signed by the signer, and the verifier then needs to take the extra step to say if I, um, you know, as I am building out the signature base string, not only uh, am I going through and I'm pulling these uh, field values, if I see one that is tagged as absent, and I go and look it up, and that's not. I, I, I understand. Right. Okay. Um, what I'm saying is, is that if I'm designing a new field and there is a semantic or especially a security implication to the state associated with the absence of the field, I have the luxury of saying, well, I'll just make that explicit mm, and then put it on okay. the water. Okay. Okay. I see what you mean. Um, that might make sense from an overall HTTP perspective, but applications might have more restrictive interpretations than, than the field definition. Possibly. All right, well, uh, I'm looking at the time. We should probably move on, but it sounds like this is an area we should focus on uh, a little bit more to, to see if we can make some more progress. All right, sounds good. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you. All right, do I move on to cookies? Eventually. Here we are. Cookies. Who is here from the cookie crew? And indeed, do we, we have, have anyone? Anyone from the cookie crew? Oh. I don't believe we do. Okay. Okay. Well, let's um, just take a quick look at the issues list to see where they're at. I think they're in a fairly good place, especially if I do a couple of things here. Uh, yeah, 27 open technically, but yeah, that's 13 minutes. Yeah, that, that's not too bad. Um, I don't know, for example, we've merged the PR for this one, so I think we can close it. Um, so yeah, 12. And mm -hmm. it looks like the rest of them are some editorial and some a little more meaty. So this is promising. Uh, we've known this as, as a long-term project. Anybody have any questions or comments about cookies, uh, knowing that the uh, all the editors are not here? Okay. Let's move on then. Uh, alternative surfaces. Mike and or Martin. I don't think a whole lot has moved here lately, but there are a number of things on the issues list that are probably worth looking at. Um, would you be able to pull that up or through one of us? So there are some related ones about how it interacts with ALPN and underlying transports that resulted in um, Lucas and Martin writing a draft. That draft probably needs to do something. It hasn't gotten a whole lot of list discussion. I'm not sure it's even been announced to the list. It's been announced to the GitHub issue. Um, basically, it's reintroducing the quick version uh, parameter and also defines one for SVCB records. So basically, you can 
broaden the scope of your alt service advertisement. And this is really just circling around the whole question of H3 requires quick V1, but then how do you advertise that you support quick V2, assuming you actually can use H3 and V2? So yeah, the, and this draft, I did a did a search on the list archives. I have not seen anybody discussing it, but it addresses the issue. If we don't adopt this draft, we need to do something else in alt service. So please look at this draft. Lucas has just pointed to the uh, to the discussion. Ah, okay. Failure of searching. Thank you. Um, then I will pull that up for later reference. And Lucas is in queue. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. You can. Okay. Um, yeah. Just a quick one. I, I did speak to the chairs maybe about potential new work, and they said no, not for this session. That's that's fine. Talk about in Philadelphia, Martin Duke and I have been working in the background. We did get a little bit of feedback um, okay. more about the uh, defining also a HTTP uh, SRR value or some such that uh, we added and put into like a draft zero one. Um, we're kind of waiting for the HTTP working group to um, probably let us pitch for a call for adoption subject to okay. discussion about the new work and that kind of thing. Um, it, you know, we, we can carry that on forward. If, if people do want to take a look at the latest draft, we're, we're more than happy to take on board some feedback, even if it's not adopted work item. So, um, thanks. I think we should definitely have a chat about this in Philadelphia. Uh, from my perspective, I'd like to step back and look at how we do versioning in HTTP and, and, and especially versioning of the transport now that we have that, that possibility. Um, I, it just feels to me like we've gone back and forth on this and had a lot of different little approaches to it over the years that it's, it's you know, based on, it, it's not that we have two sides and, and they're warring back and forth on how we should do this. It's more that, you know, there's not a lot of energy for it and people have different feelings about it. Um, so I, I'd like to try and come up with a cohesive view of it Mostly so we don't do a disservice to the rest of the community, so people aren't even more confused about how all this works, because it's already pretty confusing. That, that's mean, my perspective. Argu arguably, arguably, the disservice was we messed up ALPN and and or alt service using ALPN tokens, and now we're trying to figure out how we live with that. Yeah. Side meeting, possibly, yeah. I think uh, maybe one before the session, so we can at least get the discussion well scoped before we have the session. That might be good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's put that on the to do list then. Well, one thing that we've talked about in the past, I think, that probably needs to be raised here as well is there's um, sort of a uh, an opportunity here to look at the use cases more broadly, as you say, and design something that maybe isn't called alt service um, that fills the same space and, and addresses the use cases that people have. Um, to, to a large extent, what was service B was was originally envisaged as this sort of, well, we'll just take alt service and put it in the DNS, but it ultimately grew into its own thing with its own identity and, and mm -hmm. it's it's actually far more coherent in a sense now than uh, alt service ever was. And and taking that, the lessons we learned there and, and mm. supporting them back would be good. It's kind of what does a post service be alt service world look like? And not coincidentally, there is also an issue on that. Sixteen ninety two, basically just is talking about the interaction, and service B has good text on that. We need to match that or reference it, or so, uh, somehow align the two because the draft doesn't really acknowledge that service B exists right now. It didn't at the time. Um, 
um, other uncomfortable interaction points. Um, the alt service and origin 1691 and alt service and coalescing 1696 kind of play together on each other. In the case that you get an alt, like when you get an alt service to an alternative, that alternative has a certificate covering multiple um, multiple origins, multiple domains. What is the correct behavior for what else you use that connection for? Do you need an alt service for each individual origin that you would like to put on that connection? So you hit the origin for one, hit the primary server for one origin, get the alt service record, go to your connection, then hit it for another origin, go to the connection you've already got, or can you just trust the third? even if they don't send the origin frame. And if they do send the origin frame, ironically, the origin frame doesn't have a way to say, the third is right, use all those domains. So you have to spell out all the domains on your list. Would have been really nice to be able to send origin star, leave the third. Yeah, I can imagine that'd be a foot gun in certain situations, but yeah. It also would be nice. Well, the other foot gun is you get a new cert with more domains and you uh, forget to forget to update your hard coded origin setting. So, if anybody has comments on how how they think coalescing should work or how it is used. Please bring them to the issues or contribute them now. And given that the HTTP core you know, puts all authority. Mike, you're, you cut out, Mike. Okay. Uh, HTTP core puts authority on the cert and puts the DNS check as a Kind of, maybe you should do this, but you don't have to. Um, that kind of, that argues for once you've made a connection to an alternative and it's cert is valid for multiple origins, use it for all those origins if you, if you haven't gotten an alt service redirection yet. But we don't say that. And if we do want it that way, we should spell that out. And I don't think every browser currently does it that way. So is it going to cause problems for anybody if we change the fact to pay that? Yeah, so I'm currently engaged in in a, a, a long, slow uh, argument with someone on Bugzilla about Firefox's behavior in this regard. Um, because some other browsers operate differently and um, there's some expectation that our behavior is awkward in this particular case because we're maybe not doing DNS lookups or maybe doing DNS lookups or something I don't know exactly and it's all all around this whole coalescing mess so it'd be good to get some clarity about that mm -hmm. it would indeed I see Eric Eric's in the queue, Eric's in the queue yeah yeah the if the coalescing mess is a mess like it's the on the opposite point to it um, Martin was pointing out there are some that um, do some degree of coalescing but don't implement the origin frame. So there's no way to tell them to stop doing coalescing. So it's kind of this mixture. So we've had a, a mixture of the things we say that might make coalescing safe if you also implement some other features, end up not having that full set. So it may be worth us revisiting um, more, mm -hmm. ge more generally. Yeah, that's a good point. We tend to come at it from the standpoint of, well, all these things exist. But not everyone implements them that way. Well, and unfortunately, you know, things like origin and, and alt service are all Incremental extensions, they're not, you know, referenced in the core. And so there's no strong must nots and should nots and so forth around them. And mm -hmm. so that that's how we get into this situation. All 
All right. It sounds like a, 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 a side meeting is, is an increasingly good idea where we can talk about kind of this whole cluster of different things uh, in a structured way and then figure out if we can find a direction forward. Uh, I think that'd be okay. really useful. Um, there's one other piece that's a little bit disjoint from those um, that I also want to highlight, which is the bottom one on the list here with multi CDN. Um, so the issue here is basically you, if you're advertising the fact that you support, say, H3, you want long lifetimes on your alt service records. If you're multi CDN, you want short lifetimes on everything that points to a particular CDN, including your alt service records. So how do you have both a long and a short lifetime on your alt service records? Yeah. Um, you know, this winds up being a potential for a CDN to get misdirected traffic or hijack some traffic potentially, which is obviously not going to be their intention, but it gets weird. Yeah. That's accurate. <laughs> Lucas? Uh, hello. I think I made the same comment the last time we mentioned this issue. Like, this isn't hypothetical. This does happen. I see failed quick connections coming to us um, because of a multi CDN where one third of them, I think, I don't know, it's, it's hard to test because it's random, you know, or whatever, uh, that some, some requests return an alt service, some don't, and that causes some clients to try a quick connection with us that isn't enabled on, on the Cloudflare version. And that's, no, that's annoying for both client and the server. So I can do I don't, I don't think it can be fixed with an alt service, to be honest, like you say, it's, it's a conundrum or so something like short and long, we could try and parameterize it or do something clever. I, I think, I think, you know, alt service has served a decent purpose so far. Uh, it was kind of a stepping stone to where we got to today. Uh, let's, let's try and come up with some better holistic design, uh, aside meeting somewhere that can, can satisfy the, the range of use cases that we're all aware of now, that we have concrete things like quick um, deployed widely. Yeah, yeah between the, the the discussion we had before and, and this issue, I'm, I'm starting to suspect that the solution is not going to be called alt service. So more to discuss there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for this document, it's probably not going to have the holistic solution in it, but even just things like we mentioned already of adding references for SBCB, et cetera, will mm -hmm. help point to like, there is more in this space and <laughs> some of the solutions lay out there. So are we thinking then that we might punt some of these issues from alt service BIS and adopt something new? Well, or... it may be good to describe the issues even if you don't have solutions here. And okay. document the pitfalls. Mm -hmm. You know, point out that if you use it in this way, you're going to have this problem. Okay. All right. I think those are the key issues to hit fault service. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you, Mike, Martin. Uh, next, we have client cert, and Brian has some slides. Um, are you going to project those, or Brian, did you want me to? I can do that. Okay. Uh, if you'd give me just a moment. Let's see, share content. Uh, there, how's that? It's good. Uh, so Mike, you're gonna do this one? I can grab it. 
Oh, Brian's here. Okay, great. Great. I think the concern was the stability of his internet connection to be able to do slides. Yeah, and due, due to some weather and other things, I'm at home and it's not a concern. So, uh, things change. Anyway, uh, and I, uh, like I told Mark, I kind of rely on slides as a bit of a crutch here to get me through the talking, and it lets me shove some of these photographs of our beautiful IETF locations in your face. Um, so, I've got a few slides. I'll try to go through them quickly because you've probably seen a lot of them. Uh, with that, uh, this is Vienna. Missed everyone there. Can you give me the next one, Mark? I think you're on mute, but that's okay. A uh, quick review of sort of the context and motivation behind this. Um, it's really common for applications uh, to be deployed in a way that TLS is terminated by some kind of reverse proxy or something in front of the actual application. Um, sometimes the world uses TLS client certificate authentication. Sometimes, not always, but occasionally. And in which case, the actual application behind that um, oftentimes needs to know something about the client certificate, but that's not available. Uh, because the connection was terminated upstream. And in the absence of some sort of standardized method of conveying this information from the proxy to the back end, different implementations of proxies and so forth have done this differently, or in some cases, not at all. Next, please, Mark. And so, sort of a moving goal here, but the goal as I see it now is to produce an informational RFC that documents existing practice more or less while codifying some specific details like encoding and header names sufficient that they'll facilitate like an improved and interoperable lower touch interoperability going forward so instead of sort of complex setup and having to dig through various documentation and reverse proxy or cdn or whatever maybe it'd be more of a, a checkbox type uh, integration to turn this thing on Another goal for me anyway was to participate in this IETF world. I work mostly in the in the OAuth working group and um, was saw this problem space come up around uh, IETF 106 in Singapore and thought I'd put a draft out here so maybe I could be less of a tourist at some of the other meetings. Um, and turns out that happened right before the whole world shut down, as indicated by our interim um, meetings starting after 106 up until today. But uh, so it's uh and that went through uh sec dispatch and a couple other places landed here in http which is arguably the right place for it but i know it's also sort of a, a sideshow to most of you and and doesn't get a lot of attention um at the same time i i hope it's not too late to produce something that that'll be useful to the world and um still slowly pushing forward to on that sort of a sideshow to me as well so it doesn't always get everything but here we are uh so next slide please mark so the basic approach to this draft is you got a client talks to the first proxy uh, doing you know HTTP over some mutually authenticated TLS connection. That proxy does all everything, verifies the certificate on presentation, sanitizes headers on subsequent requests, um, and it passes the client certificate, the end entity certificate, along as this client cert header field um, encoded as a um, structured header binary encoding the whole certificate, and it maybe also includes the client certificate chain, um, if so configured to do so between the two, if, if that's something that this deployment or application needs. Um, and that's it. all there is to it, surprisingly simple, although there's you know, devils in the details, but, but that's the main idea. And uh, next slide. So some recent, recent things that have happened, I published a, draft 02 earlier or last week really had some pretty minor changes i added a note about uh certificate retention on tls session resumption so some implementations won't retain the client certificate information across uh resumptions and this note basically says that might happen um, in that case either you know don't offer resumption to mutually authenticated connections or don't offer this feature if you can't um, sort of treat the, the connections consistently from the perspective of information you pass along to the back end. Uh, Martin helped with the wording on that. Thank you. And also added a note or really a requirement um, that says in the case of multiple post handshake client certificate authentications, uh, which shouldn't happen very often, if ever, um, I think maybe I'll go with not very often say to use only the last one for these, these um, particular header fields. Um, it, it, I don't know if I need to justify that anymore. It struck me as such a, a 
edge 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 case that trying to accommodate it mm -hmm. any more than that um, just seemed unnecessary. And those are two small things that are added to the recent draft. Um, and so the last slide, Mark has a picture of where some of us hopefully will be uh, in not too long a time. And the two open issues on this, um, the, uh, let's see, so they, they are related in some sense. The, the first one is that there's, um, David was concerned there's no mechanism for error signaling between the origin back to the reverse proxy um, at, in terms of signaling errors and how that might translate back into the TLS connection in the front end. And my take based on the, the way things work now in practice and the general scope and goal of the draft is that this is out of scope. That if there's some problem that the origin has, it, it should be, you know, it, it may be doing uh, it, error codes to represent something unauthorized. It may be doing more granular uh, permissions, um, but it, it's largely going to happen at the application there. And while there may potentially be some scenarios, and yes, client certificate authentication and how the browsers handle that and how they reset certificate selections and so forth is rather problematic or can be rather problematic in terms of user experience. Um, that's just beyond the scope of this draft trying to address. And this may arguably like exacerbate some of those issues, but I don't really think it does. I think we're still just sort of codifying what a lot of deployments do anyway, and trying to define something more just would be um, over-engineering and building things that, that won't be used or deployed. Um, and so I, I've left this open here sort of just for this sort of general conversation, but I'm, I'm inclined to uh, close it out. Um, I'm seeing questions pop up, so maybe it would be good to go there before we continue. Yep. Mike? Um, so my inclination is kind of the same. I think the this is something you can get to even on a single server, right? So you configure your HTTP stack to accept client certificates, ask for a client certificate. The client picks a certificate that it legitimately has. It, it can, has a private key, it can prove it has it, it changed up to a known CA, but it's not a certificate that grants you access to that resource. And the server sends you back to 403 and you close your browser and you try again because that's annoying, but you screwed up and picked the wrong certificate or you don't have the right certificate. This doesn't change that dynamic. It's still an HTTP, you're not authorized, even though you gave me a real certificate. Let's just close these issues and move on. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with Mike there. It, it can happen now. Um, I think the, the splitting of it across a draft like this makes it sort of more obvious that that it could happen or, or raises the possibility of it and it would be harder to do any other way without this mechanism. But I, to that end, I, I still don't believe it's worth trying to address here for all, for all that brings. Um, sorry, should I be going to the well, queue? I, I, or I, I, I can, I'm, I'm next in queue, so I can just jump in oh, here. Oh, yeah, uh, I see. I didn't even notice. Tommy, EDM. Yeah, no, it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo. Um, so on this particular issue, I, I agree with what's been said. I do see there's a comment from Martin on here that one of the things it mentions in it is, you know, clients can treat it getting a 401 as a signal that, you know, the server doesn't like your authentication, whatever that may be. Um, I, I don't see anything about specific errors like 401 mentioned in the document. I'm wondering if maybe it'd just be useful to indicate like, for example, you know, this is something a server may do um, and not really require that you have to do that, but just point to that as like, this is 
there's already a paradigm for saying that you're not authorized to access the content. And if you thought that you should be authorized to access the content based on your client cert, maybe there's something wrong with your client cert. Just leave it at that. I don't know if that's useful. Um, I don't know either. It's certainly reasonable. Um, if, and the folks here would know better than I, I think the actual reality of, of giving a 401, someone could tell me is not a 401 required to also include a, a WWW authenticate, um, header. I and think it would be a 403. Yeah. Oh, sorry. 403. Sorry. 403. Yeah. Sorry. Um, thank you, Mike or whoever. In which case, yeah, it could come without any. It, it's a little weird because it's a sort of crossing these layers, um, but we could certainly say something along the lines of you could 403, you could limit the the content return, you could error at whatever layer. Um, I'm open if, if folks think that would be helpful. It, it just may help to have some text such that if people are asking this question in the future, they're like, oh, Here's something that's mentioning it without trying to define anything new. Yeah, just mentioning the possibility that. Yeah. One other minor writer question before we move on that I just had to get at the very beginning. You're mentioning how this is informational. I don't remember if we had discussed it much as a group, but is this correct to be informational versus proposed standard since it is adding a header field to the registry? <laughs> like. Um, that that's a really fair question, and I'm um, I'm sort of going with the flow on things here. Ecker originally had some very, very strong pushback on the mechanism in general. Felt that it was insecure, that it was promoting insecure deployments because it, it if the proxy doesn't sanitize the headers appropriately, it kind of fails open, and it yeah. allows for injection. And he just um, he didn't like it at all, and I, I understand that, but I'm sort of following sure. up with trying to. Um, there's not really a, a better widely applicable option, and this is how things work. So let's document it and his objections were basically. Um, uh, mitigated or preempted by changing it to informational. He said he'd be okay if it was an informational document versus a standard track document. And that was enough for me to kind of. Flip it over and, and try to get the the resistance out of the way to move it forward. I can't even remember when that happened. I think it was right, yeah. maybe right before working group adoption or right after. Must have been right before. It, it was before. It was before adoption. Yeah, I remember that. We should go back and look what we said in the call for adoption and uh, the other discussions we have at the time. Um, do you, I mean, I've wondered sometimes if informational is quite right, uh, but. Uh, so, certainly, informational can make the registrations. That that's not an issue. Um, so, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If I can, I mean, I'm I'm next in the queue. But if I can jump in on that conversation, uh, I think. I, oh, I think Mark. Right? But yeah. Apologies. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Jump in. Okay. I feel like we're landing somewhere in between because. A lot of CDNs do something like this, and so we want to describe what the CDNs do and align the CDNs that are already doing this while acknowledging that this would not necessarily be a recommended practice by the IETF. Like, that sounds it's, not, it's not exactly informational because we are specifying something that is not exactly what's already happened. Good thing to do. This is just a necessary thing to do sometimes. And maybe it's experimental. Maybe it, I don't know. I don't think it's experimental, but well, it's just documenting we'll common see. practice, right? So, yeah. yeah. But it's also not documenting anyone's existing common practice. It's really similar yeah, but... to existing common practice, but not exactly. We have a comment from our area director that it sounds like informational to her, and um, I, I don't think we should spend too much time in the working group 
debating what the status should be. I think uh, we need we need to do our homework and figure out what was said when we adopted it. So, uh, Brian, did you want to cover in 1927 as well? Um, so Martin deferred to me, but he's oh, going to you, sorry. I think. Yeah, I, I think, I think we have a resolution to this, um, the first issue that Brian raised here, which is to discuss the implications, but I don't think what, what David seems to be requesting here is, is really reasonable within the scope of this mechanism. I, I actually don't think it's reasonable period, but, um, uh, the idea that we build a layered protocol and then have some expectation of of interlayer communication and coordination to the extent that you you're able to forward an HTTP request, get the response back, and then generate signals at the TLS layer is uh, terrible. Would be a terrible outcome. So um, I, I think we we need to uh, to to do text. Um, as far as Echo's concerns with this one, I would be white screen. Go Mark. Um, I'd be very happy to to say that this is um, standards track, um, as long as we properly address the security implications of of this. Yeah, Mark has just checked his cameras and. So we've lost the display mark. Um, I, at least I have. I think Martin. Yep. Um, oh, white screen. White screen. Uh, I I concur at least with the the first part of what he said, the Martin. Um, for the same reasons, I I think it would be yeah that kind of layering and signaling after the response would be yeah, bad and and unnecessary and well beyond the scope of this. Um, I can uh, look at adding some sort of um, not even guidance text, but some general discussion text to your point, Tommy, about, you know, if the application doesn't like the cert, here's some things you could do, um, including 403, possibly other types of things, just to make sure it's discussed. Um, the other issue that I don't have the number on here, the, somewhere in the white screen, is uh, came out of the last interim where uh, Martin had suggested that the rather than the somewhat ambiguous and wordy discussion of what the client cert chain header contains currently, he suggested that the ordering just defer to what the client presented in uh, the the TLS handshake. And um, at the time I said that, that seems reasonable. And uh, a few months later, when I went to actually make the change and was looking at the wording in the document itself, I, I really started to have reservations about it. Um, and some of it comes back to, um, I think, ambiguity about what should be or what is in the client certificate chain header itself and whether that represents the certificates that the client presented in the handshake, which could potentially be some sort of complex tree structure based on cross signing and other things that um, I have a hard time wrapping my head around. And I don't know how often they occur in client certificate scenarios, but it's certainly possible. And I know there's some wording in there uh, talking about the second issue down here, 1927, or whether the information presented in this header should be the chain which was actually used in the validation um, and assembled by and used by the, the server and passed along. And I had always sort of thought of it as the latter. Um, Martin thinks of it as the former and in some cases has worn me down on uh, various GitHub uh, arguments that are rather one sided where he just berates me and tells me what to think and eventually I uh, come to reason with it. But on this one, I'm, I'm sort of rethinking and I'm, I'm unsure. And so I'm, I'm sort of looking for, I don't know what I'm looking for as I read it now. It's somewhat ambiguous. 
I'm almost inclined to leave it that way. As I, as I look at documentation of things like uh, Apache and Nginx, it's unclear to me when you configure them to produce something like the chain, what they provide, um, whether it's, it's what, the, what the client gave or whether it's what the, the server used. Um, that sort of lines up with what we have in the text, but we could push it one way or the other. Um, I don't fully understand the use case for including the chain anyway, so I'm sort of in the weeds to begin with. Um, and, but all that said, uh, if you presume that the client is, what the client presented is going to be passed along verbatim, it sort of assumes this model where the backend's trust anchors are completely different or potentially completely different. And going back to the prior issue, there's no way then for during the handshake for the server to convey a list of anchors that it accepts when it doesn't know that they are because the backend has a different set and it gets back into this potential sort of missing signaling and layering. And I certainly don't want to add anything um, to, to allow that to happen. I don't even know how that would work. Um, but I'm, it, it, in some sense, it's sort of this minor issue, but I'm, I'm a bit stuck on it and not sure how to proceed. And I do feel like it's been largely um, a, a pretty small conversation between a, a really small group of individuals. Um, and so it's hard to say that I, I have, you know, feel like I have working group consensus on that at this point. Um, that's a rambling summary, hopefully, of uh, not sure what to do with this one. So maybe I can help a little bit here. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of things that we're sort of assuming in this deployment model that the the origin server trusts the gateway with. And um, primarily this is a scenario where you you trust the the gateway to offer a valid certificate, look at all the content of the messages, um, and ultimately uh, faithfully represent that the certificates that it got from the client are accurate, right? You also need the gateway to validate the signature that the client offers, because there's no way to validate a signature in this case. There's there's then a choice um, for the for the origin server. The origin server can trust that the um, that the gateway has correctly validated the certificate chain for the client, the chains to a configured trust anchor, and all of all all that sort of stuff. In which case, it doesn't need the client search chain field at all. It can defer all the processing of the, the client certificate, except for perhaps, you know, we need to know which one it was that you got in order for us to do authorization decisions. So in that case, you don't need the client search chain. If you do have the client search chain coming through, that is either because the, um, the gateway has done the full certificate validation and there's things about the intermediaries that will, the intermediate certificates that will determine how you process the request. That one seems a little bit um, sort of science fiction to me. I would hope that everything you need is in the end entity certificate um, when you're making those sorts of decisions, but who knows? So maybe maybe you would have that that scenario. And that sort of fits more in line with the, the scenario that you were describing, where, whereby the, the gateway does the full chain validation, builds something and says, here's what it is, um, but it needs to provide the extra information to the to the back end for, for processing. The other model yeah. is where the um, where all the gateway does is validate the certificate and then the chain construction and all the other higher level validation processing happens in the back end. And that to me seems like a more natural fit for the um, for the for the field, I don't think you need to exclude one or the other. Um, okay. I was always hoping that this would just be present the information as you as you construct it in this way, um, or as it was constructed, just present it across um, without any sort of strict rules about things. Because the the instant we got into writing all the rules for how these would be constructed we started getting into a whole lot of confusing things and contradictory statements with TLS specs and that sort of thing. So I, I think a, a little bit more work here is necessary to just sort of say, 
if you do this, then do this, if you do this, then do this, but it's not really prescriptive necessarily either way. That makes sense. Um, I think so. Yes, I, th I think it sounds like we're not as far off. No. From where we want, where we imagine this landing than I was anticipating. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and maybe back to where I got to trying to make the change. You, I thought you were suggesting as I look at the text, I struggle a bit with. How to work that in, but, um, certainly can revisit it and, and work on it further. Um. Uh, yeah. yeah, and for for whatever it's worth, as you described the two scenarios, um, like it, I have seen in our own application deployments scenarios where they want the one you described as science fiction, where there are application level constraints based on the context of use, where they want to, um, you know, constrain the the acceptable issuers basically. Um, so want access to that information all the way up. Um, and whereas the, the scenario you described is more plausible, I, I still am, feels more science fiction -y to me, but I understand your reasoning. I worry about the deployment model. I worry about the potential security implications as well as like the performance. You'd have to cache that information or process it on every request, which seems a little scary. Um, but anyway, I, I at the same time, I'm encouraged by your reaction and I, I will. I guess take another look at it and and maybe ping you with some. Yeah, I, I just have to look at it again and see if I can work that sort of reasoning in there without. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that we don't go overly prescriptive in in this. Um, a suggestion that it follow the order in, uh, as as it was uh, presented in TLS would be, I think, reasonable. Um, a suggestion yeah. that it follows the order of the constructed chain, if only the constructed chain is is used, would also be reasonable. Um, and just a little more clarity about what the expectations are around how how this used might might also help as well. Okay. Okay, any more discussion on this draft? All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, sounds like we'll, we, we might be able to get to a working group last call pretty soon on this. What you think? Uh, I would not disagree with that. I think there's some, a few things, but they're maybe not so major. And so yes, uh, yes. Great, great, sounds good. And we'll uh, we'll follow up on on the uh, status question, Tommy and I will. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Right. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is query. Uh, Julian can't make it, and he's the the active author on this one. Uh, if we look at the open issues just to get a sense of where they're at, uh, we can see they've got what one PR and ten issues open. Uh, so Julian suggested, uh, uh, due to the nature of some of the issues, it might be good to have a, a, a design team meeting uh, set up to work through them and talk about them. So I, I think uh, we might try and do that uh, in the time between now, or at least set up a design team between now and uh, Philadelphia, and and perhaps talk to them about reporting in uh, in in Philadelphia, so we can make progress in the draft. So uh, I think Tommy and I will talk to Julian a bit more about that, and if uh, we do set up a design team, we'll send out a note to the to the working group list about that. Uh, so stay tuned. Did anybody have any questions or comments about this draft, or or should we just move on? Okay. That leaves us uh, with one more to discuss: uh, the retrofit draft, which is the one that I'm working on. Um, I did a couple of updates this recently, and so we only have one open issue. Unfortunately, it's about cookies, and I was hoping to talk to the cookie folks. Uh, but but this issue is basically that uh, it would be you know super nice if we're going to eventually have a binary representation, for example, of uh, um, structured fields 
that we would be able to understand what the type of the cookie value were so that we could serialize in a more efficient manner. As for example, if it's you know binary content, rather than serializing as a base64 string, well, serialized as binary, that would be kind of cool. But we need to understand if, if there is a type for uh, an applicable type of, of the data in the value, or is it just a string? Um, and so one way to go about doing that would be to uh, introduce a new cookie parameter that gives a hint as to the type of the, of the value. Um, and that way it can survive being trans, you know, transformed into a textual you know, representation as well, or, or a non-structured, you know, uh, tra transitioning through a non-structured field hop, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. Um, but I, I, I did want to talk to the cookie folks about it. And, and more generally, uh, some of the changes we've made in the most recent draft around cookies uh, have introduced the idea that, you know, individual parameters have a structured type uh, that, that you can rely upon. Uh, and so that has implications for the future of cookies. If new parameters are introduced down the road, we need a process for that to make sure that they have structured types uh, associated as well. Uh, so I wanted to get a, a sense from, from the cookie folks as to whether they were comfortable with these changes and what we were doing here. I think this is probably one of the places where this retrofit process is more intrusive on the to the semantics of of the original header so I wanted to uh, have that discussion but they're not here so uh, maybe we'll have that discussion in Philadelphia other than that I think this draft is ready to go although I got some rather strong private fee feedback about the change to tables um, in the latest draft and especially I think how it looks the textual version uh, but that was after consultation with the RFC editor, so I'm not sure what to do about that. Let's see. It, it, it is pretty awful, I think. Let's see. Yeah, we, we have these lovely lines everywhere, so yay. Um, but beyond purely editorial issues like that, I think this is pretty much ready to go. Uh, and if folks want to um, have a look at it, that's great. Uh, I think we just have that one issue to, to, to resolve before we, uh, before we can go work in group last call. Uh, would SF Martin asks, would SF cookie emit that parameter? That that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I haven't thought about that. My my first inclination would be to to keep the parameter there just so that it's easy to transit. But then again, you're duplicating information, and there's a possibility of mismatches or whatever, which is not great. So I'd, I'd have to think about that more. I think. Any other questions or comments about this draft? Have people looked at it? I know at least one person looked at it because they got a bad comment about the table formatting, so that's good. It's no worse than the tables and any other RFC. Move on. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I think it's just more an incentive to look at the HTML version, to be honest. That too. There are people who read the text versions, mostly the old cranky, you know, old school types who uh, don't mind being vocal about table formatting. So, or italics, I learned recently. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think that's it then, Tommy. Do we have anything else? That covers it. Um, yeah. Thanks to everyone. And if you have new things you want to propose, then we'll take those at one fourteen. Absolutely. And and we are planning to meet in Philadelphia. We've requested two sessions. We're already talking about side meetings, so I think it's going to be a productive meeting. So if, if you're able to make it, it'll be great to see everyone there. By the way, thank you for actually going back to having meetings at the IETF. I'm not looking forward to getting on a plane, but yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we'll give everybody their mornings or afternoons or evenings back then for, for the main of the time. Thanks, everybody, for showing up, and we'll hopefully see you in Philadelphia. Bye, everyone. <laughs>